We believe that God is with you right where you are right now. And it is his desire to lead you in an ever growing passionate relationship with his son, Jesus. And we would love to help you with that. Because of who Jesus is and what he did in his life, death and resurrection, we can have new life. So we're excited to follow him together with you. So we invite you to give your full attention to God this morning and join with us as we begin our worship service. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to those who are making their way into the sanctuary, and welcome to everybody who's joining us online. Uh, this morning, I offer you a psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship with the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Stand and join as we sing joyful songs of praise to the Lord.
Lord, we come before you this morning, God, some with, with heavy hearts, Lord, some full of joy, God, some of us dreading the snow that's out there. Lord, we come before you as, as we are, God, with whatever distraction, with whatever fear or anxiety, God, maybe with some excitement, Lord, but you know our hearts, God, you see us. Whether we stand in the sanctuary, Lord, or whether we sit at home on our couch, God, you are there next to us. Lord, thank you for your goodness. God, for your love, for the way that your mercies are new every morning. God, that we might show up, that I might show up, Lord, knowing that you have called me, Lord, that you have called us to join you this morning, to sit in your presence. God, to hear from you. Lord, to receive an encouragement, God. And I just pray that each of us here this morning, everyone listening online, that we would all have an open heart. God, that we would have the ears to hear what you want to tell us. God, that that piece of the message that was meant just for us, God, that we might receive it. Lord, we pray for the unrest that is around the world. God, for the unrest in Gaza. Lord, for the people who are dying, Lord, we pray your presence there also. Lord, we pray for intervention. God, we pray knowing that you can do all things. God, we pray for the unrest in our hearts. Lord, for the hurting that's going on in our own church family. God, we pray for Brian Klein, God, that, that he would have clarity and peace, Lord. 
that his family and, and the supporters in that situation would know what to do with next steps, God. In his ongoing health, God, just be present with him. Lord, we lift up Helen Bacon, Lord, the beloved Baconator. God, be with her in this time. Continue to use her story. Lord, we praise you for all things good. We praise you for the hard things. Thank you for being with us in all of it. You are good, Lord. You're so good. In your name, amen. Thank you for joining me in prayer. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. God is here, he is present, and he wants to speak to you. There's so much going on in our church. There's lots to pray for and there's lots to celebrate. And Pastor James is going to join me on stage to share a little bit about our celebrations. All right, so thank you. Well, there's, I, I, this is fun. I get to tell you about some awesome things that are happening. Um, if you remember, some of you will remember a month ago we had the Greenhouse Initiative. That's a two-day conference. And really what it is, that is, it's about being developed more as a disciple, as someone who disciples others and really being built up as a leader. And so we had close to 40 people out to that, and that was really exciting. But then there's another part to it, eight weeks of huddling. That means it's a smaller group, it's a little more intense in a small group, and it's really centered on leadership development. And um, we've kicked off six huddles, 35 people followed up on that weekend, and are in an eight-week huddle and trying to be trained to be a better disciple maker of Jesus. And so we want to celebrate that. And then also the coldest night of the year, we just had that. And we had three LEMC teams that were a part of that, raising funds. And um, dozens walked, and uh, it's to help those experiencing hunger, hurt, and homelessness. And uh, so, and it was a, a cold night. Um, We've had some warm ones, but of course that was a cold one. The first one was so cold and stormy, we actually pushed it back a week, and then it was still cold. But that's why we do it, because we want to experience what they experience. We want to be able to walk, not when it's easy, but when it's hard. And the money raised for that was $5,380. Let's just give everyone a hand for being a part of that. That is such a blessing. So thank you for being so generous as a congregation. Thank you for those of you that were on teams and walked in that and helped organize that. And that is just such a blessing to everyone in our community. Incredible. I, that gets me so excited. Um, yeah, and there's, I mean, things that have happened in the past. There's lots to look forward to still. We have VBS sign up. I don't know if there's any kids who are looking forward to that. We were reminiscing before the service about um, when I was in VBS, which is probably longer ago than what you all think it was. Um, but I still have such fond memories of, of that time. And VBS, I think, is a really special time for, for kids, for volunteers too. And so um, the dates for that is July 15th to 19th. And so we're starting at this time to collect some volunteers. So um, we'd love to have new faces, old faces, people who... Um, Oh, I should clarify. By old faces, I mean people who volunteered at VBS. Um, but people of all ages are welcome as well. That sounded bad, didn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the more volunteers that we have, the better able we're to support all the kids that come. And uh, we have lots of kids who come here to LEMC for that week. Um, so that's really exciting. We also are planning a Father's Day car show. I know we've done this in the past. It's been a pretty cool event. Um, and that's going to be Thursday. Um, at 7 p.m. at the church, though I think there should be probably more information to follow up with that, but you can expect that in, in coming weeks. Um, child dedication class, so that's March 24th um, before the service at 9 a.m. That's going to come up pretty quick, but at LEMC, we, we really encourage parents to, to dedicate their, their kids, to raise them in the faith, to... Um, to join, you know, LEMC family and for us to be able to walk alongside you and, and your family in that. So, um, yeah, we, we invite you to do that. There's, there's lots to learn. Um, if you would like to learn more about it before signing up, um, just to understand what, it, what does it mean to, to dedicate your child or your children, um, you can register online through the LEMC. They'll, they'll, there'll be people at the Welcome Center who can help you with that as well, if you'd like. 
Um, and last but certainly not least, we have the if, if gathering coming up. So for all the lovely ladies in the room, that, um, yeah, is really just a time to be refreshed, to be encouraged, to have some teaching, some time of worship, um, and community, community with, with other women. So um, that, there's not a date for it on here, but it is coming up um, quite, quite shortly. So that, the information for that will be online as well. Um, but again, if, if you see someone at the Welcome Center, they can probably pass along more information than what I currently have right now. Um, so yeah, there's lots going on, lots to be excited for. Um, and with that, we're going to jump to our intro um, for the message today. Have you ever struggled with loss and disappointment? Or felt far from God? Do you ever wish that you could reset or have a do-over? Do you need an opportunity to have a fresh start or create a new trajectory for your life? This is my story. A story of my journey from bitterness to delight. A story of how desolation led to navigating loss with hope. It's my story of going from ruin to restoration and from loneliness to belonging. Welcome. Welcome, good morning. Welcome online. My name is Pastor James. I'm one of the two co-lead pastors here. And uh, yeah, we're jumping into the book of Ruth. We're looking at journeying from bitterness to delight. Bitterness to delight. When things go wrong, how do we handle that? What do we do to regain our joy? To experience the delight of God in our lives again? And uh, just before I jump into that, I want to make a little bit of a, a, um, an announcement too about the um, VBS. I was talking with Pastor... Carter and Pastor Aaron, and we were all reminded, the three of us, that we all came to faith at a very young age. It was five for me. I think Pastor Carter said it was the same at five. And uh, Pastor Aaron, it was under 10, right? You were very young too. Yep. So I just want to underline the importance of VBS. You know, it's not that we didn't rededicate ourselves or have to journey and understand more about our journey, but that commitment the three of us made, at that young age, stuck. And sometimes we don't realize the importance of speaking into the lives or the things like VBS where we're, where we're impacting young kids. We sometimes don't realize how much of that they glean, how much of it they get, how much of it is going to impact or change the trajectory of their life. And yet it was neat as we talked as three pastors, that was when our lives were changed. And so it is an incredible opportunity to minister. And as we partner with the CRC Church, and uh, we're able to impact so many more kids than most churches. I mean, we've had up to 200 before because we can have so many volunteers. And so I would encourage you to already look at your calendars. That's why we're getting the date out sooner this year. You know, maybe this year you're like, you know what? As scary as it may be, as much as I'm not sure how I will handle being in a group of kids— as much as I'm not sure how well I can do in that role, I want to be a part of impacting them in their faith journey. And I would encourage you to sign up, set that week aside. Maybe it means juggling or moving something else in your schedule for the summer, but we need you, the kids need you, and it makes a difference. That's what I want to tell you about that VBS, because uh, it made a difference in my life having those things even at a young age. And so this is an amazing opportunity. And it, it is incredible how many kids we have here in our VBS. What an incredible thing we have going. So I just wanted to mention that before I launch into the message today, because it's very near and dear to my heart. It's impacted my kids in their faith journeys when they come and get to hear and experience the message that is a part of five days of being together with other kids and hearing the stories of faith, the different stories that we share in VBS. And so a shout out to anyone who's been a part of it in the past. Uh, you are making a difference. So in our series, we went through chapter one of the book of Ruth. And we've been introduced to some people. We learned it was set in the time 
where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so I talked about that's just like our culture. You decide on your own truth. What is truth to you? This book was set in a time just like ours. It was a great famine, not just physically, but probably spiritually. And people were crying out, for, trying to find help, not just physically. But we read about this family, and they moved away from Bethlehem, and they moved over to Moab, which was considered a very ungodly nation, an ungodly place. And while they were there, they, they had tragedy. More tragedy fell upon them. And so just to go over the names again, we had Elimelech, my God is King, Naomi, pleasant, delightful, their two sons, Malon, Kilon, sick and tired, who died. Orpa, Gazelle, Ruth, friendship. Those were the two ladies they married. And so in our story, Elimelech, and sick and tired, died. Naomi decides to return to Bethlehem, return to her God, return to her people. She needs help. And she returns, but she doesn't want her daughters to experience what she's going through. She wants to set them free, her daughter-in-laws. And so one of them does decide to return back, and we have this beautiful part we ended on with Ruth saying, no, I am with you. I am committed to you. I'm going to experience whatever you're experiencing, whether good or bad. Your God is my God. And she goes with her. And then upon returning, everyone's, there's a stir. Everyone's talking. They're like, Naomi's back. Naomi's back. Obviously, she was well-known. She was well-liked. And she tells them, no, I'm not Naomi anymore. I'm bitterness. I'm broken. My name is Mara. That is who I am now. And so it's just kind of, it was very sad to see how she'd allowed the things that were affecting her on the outside impact her, her identity, her heart, her soul, where she was at. And so she was in this dark place. And that's where we ended. And we talked about even in the midst of that darkness, though, there were good things happening that she wasn't seeing because of she was focusing on all these bad things. In the midst of that, her daughter-in-law was so committed to her and so ready to help her in any way she could. And so we're going to jump into chapter 2. And so that's, that's all you need to read out of. Just turn to Ruth chapter 2. We're going to travel through there. You don't need to jump anywhere else. And so if you have your online Bible, jump there. If you have an actual Bible in front of you, turn to that page. And we're just going to walk through this. And we're going to continue to discover the rest of this story. And I love how it starts. Because for me, I was like, this brought back some memories, and I'll explain that for you. So number one, verse one, it says this. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. If you have ever watched a Hallmark movie, hand up if you've watched a Hallmark movie. It's okay, guys, if you have too. You can put up your hand. You know that usually within the first 10 minutes, there's a guy introduced, and he is the hero, or he's going to be the love interest in it. And here, very quickly on, we have Boaz, just like that. Oh, and then there was this guy, Boaz. And he enters into the picture. But I love the Hebrew word used here. Used here, it is actually a strong, wealthy, prominent, wise man enters in. Now, it even emphasizes strong twice. So this is a man's man. Man of great strength in body, mind, and heart. Doesn't get any better than that, does it? So single ladies, this is the kind of man you're looking for. A Boaz. And he enters the scene. And you know that this chapter is going to be different. Something is about to happen. And so let's travel on. Verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. They're desperate. I'll just go. I don't know who's going to allow me to gather. But whoever is, I'm going to go and I'm going to look and try and gather anything I can. In Israel, there was a, um, they actually had some rules about you had to look after widows and orphans. And one of the things you did when you were gathering your, your wheat is you didn't go back and gather anything you missed. You actually purposefully left that behind so that those people could gather it. It was a way of providing for the poor. Not everyone did it, though. And so she's wondering, can I find a field where they actually will do that? where I can gather, where I can work at providing for us. We need to move on. And Ruth says to Naomi, um, Naomi says, sorry, to her, go ahead, my daughter. We need it. Go ahead. And it's a bit risky, 
She doesn't know where she's going to end up. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. She's following behind them, trying to find the scraps, whatever they're leaving behind. It's not much, it's hard work. And I love this phrase, as it turned out. As it turned out. Doesn't that sound like a Hallmark movie? Oh, just, you know, coincidentally it worked out. Now, the Israelites do not believe in coincidence. Everything is from the hand of God, whether good or bad. So it's a tongue-in-cheek statement made by the author. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech, a relative. So, of the hundreds of fields she could have ended up in, she ends up in Boaz's field. God has led her to this field as she has stepped out to take some initiative in providing for them and getting them out of this difficult place. God is intervening. Sometimes he does it subtly. We don't realize that he meets us as we step out. I don't know if you've heard the saying, God cannot direct a parked car. In this passage, Ruth is stepping out and allowing God to use her. As we step out, God honors our actions. Sometimes when times are dark or tough, that's the hardest thing to do. And Ruth is helping Naomi. And it's beautiful that Ruth is actually driven by her desire to help provide for her mother-in-law. And we need that. When we're in a difficult place, sometimes the best thing is to help someone else. Because it does bless us. And we're going to see how this is very much the case here. And God's timing is perfect. This is why I think of it like as a Hallmark movie at this point. Because watch how this continues to unfold. Verse 4, just then Boaz arrived. Just then Boaz arrived. From Bethlehem, he greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. So now we find out something else. Strong, wise, godly. He's a man who bestows blessings on people. He loves the Lord, his God. This guy just keeps getting better and better. The Lord bless you, they answered. His workers, he gets along well with them. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters right away, who does that young woman belong to? He sees her instantly. He obviously knows everyone. And he, she catches his eyes. You can see this love story already starting to build. Who is that woman? Who does she belong to? Where is she from? Tell me more. The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. See, now she's already got a label. She's the Moabite. It's not that she's Ruth. She's the Moabite. So she's already kind of looked at in a bad lens. She's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvester. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So despite the fact that she's a Moabite, something stuck out to the overseer. He's like, she has worked so hard from morning till now, barely took a rest. That caught his attention. He mentions it. So even he has noticed something about her character. Even as she's only been there for a day, he's like, wow, she is a hard worker. So she's known for that. And now the whole village has been talking. They know who she is. It's hard to undo that when everyone's talking about you and and they're labeling you as the foreigner, the Moabite. So she's already got a label, unfortunately, and she's working to undo that label. But there's some things that people already know about her that are good, too. So Boaz calls her over and says to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get drink from the water jars my men have filled, his own workers. He's inviting her in to be family. This is not normal treatment of a foreigner. He is so caring and considerate. And she was not expecting this. And she replies, at this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? She uses that label again. I'm a no one. I'm not part of what you guys are doing. I'm not an Israelite. 
and yet you're being kind to me. And I think this is such a beautiful part of the story. He's kind, caring. She's found a place of security and protection. She wasn't sure what was going to happen. Now within one day, everything seems to have shifted. As she stepped out, everything seems to have shifted. A place where she'd be able to provide for herself and her mother-in-law. And the kindness he's treating her with is just so unexpected. It's just what you need when you're struggling, isn't it? You need someone to just lavish kindness on you. It restores you. And so she's experiencing that. But I want to tell you a little bit more about why I think Boaz is doing this. Um, Paul Harvey used to have a program where he would talk about the rest of the story. Some of you know that. He would tell you something and then he would tell you the rest of the story. So let me tell you the rest of the story here. In Matthew 5, two, verses 2, and then I'll jump to 5, we see something that doesn't seem that significant, but it's our clue about what's really going on here. I'm going to read that to you. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. You're probably wondering a genealogy. Wow, what did you find in here? Verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. It just seems like a little bit of an afterthought. It's added in there. You rarely see that, that a woman is mentioned in the genealogy, and yet it specifically does that. Rahab, if you don't know, but you probably do know, or when the Israelites came to invade the land, the promised land, they sent out spies. They were looking at taking over Jericho. And the spies, when they were out, they were gathering information. They were found out. The soldiers came to arrest them. And a woman invited them in and hid them and protected them. Her name was Rahab. Foreigner. She was a prostitute. She was someone despised, looked down on, and yet she protected them and sent them on their way. She would then ask in return, can you protect me when you invade? I believe that this city, your God, is going to give it to you. But can you protect me and my family? And they made a, a pact where there would be a, I think it was a scarlet or a purple cloth put out the window. And that would signify that was the place for the soldiers to leave alone. That God, that was someone who was protected by God. And so then we read this in Hebrews 11.31. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. It was by faith. She was a woman of faith. She believed in the God of the Israelites. She believed that he was the true God and he was going to help them conquer the city. The most unlikely person in the city, maybe. And she was spared. And then we find out that she joined the Israelites. She married a man named Salmon. She embraced their God. His God became her God. Does that sound familiar? It's exactly what Ruth said. And they raised this godly man, Boaz. And Boaz, having experienced that story, having experienced the journey his own mother had been on, foreign woman, despised, looked down on, but showed she, she came to faith in the God of the Israelites. She joined the people she was married in, and she became a godly woman. It was by faith. The Bible says she was a woman of faith. And he sees this, he knows this, and he's like, you know what? It doesn't matter that she's a foreign woman. She's embraced our God, and I want to help look after her. And I think it's such a beautiful part of the story, how this is the one person maybe in Israel who would have understood this, understood her journey, would have had compassion on her like this, and God puts him in her path. As we step out, God is looking after us. But there's another part to this story. He knows her story. Let's read about this. Boaz replied in verse 11, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and your mother and your homeland, came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. You may be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. And she replies, May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. 
And then his kindness continues. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. Have our prepared meal. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, she got up to go right back to work. Boaz gave orders to his men. So he's really impressed. And at this point now, he starts to turn the kindness on even more. Let her gather right among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Let her wander right up into the large bundles. Even pull out some stalks for her and leave it right on the ground in front of her. And don't rebuke her. So as you're going along, now you're going to just even start to drop large bundles in front of her as she's gathering. And so I think he's starting to make it very clear that he likes her, that he's impressed, and that he wants to help provide for her. It just gets better and better. Now this is all in the course of the first day. And so she, can tur- she returns home. And I love what happens as she returns home. I'm going to have to pull up my Bible because one of my notes dropped. I'm just going to read along with you. Naomi is flabbergasted. Naomi knows that something has happened that is out of the norm. And we pick up for that in verse 24. Oh, sorry, back to um, 17. Thank you. One of my notes fell down. So Ruth gathered barley there all day, and when she beat out the grain that evening, it filled an entire basket. She carried it back into town and showed it to her mother-in-law. Ruth also gave her the roasted grain that was left over from her meal. So not only did she have a huge bundle, that's a large amount that she probably could barely carry. And Naomi responds like this. Where did you gather all this grain today? What on earth happened? This is not what she was expecting. What happened? There's no way you gathered all this. Can you hear that little bit of excitement growing in Naomi's voice? There's a bit of a twinkle in her eye again. She's really excited. Where did you work? May the Lord bless the one who helped you. This could not have been done without someone showing favor and helping her out. Naomi identifies that immediately and realizes that there's something that's going on here. Now, it actually says, um, it's actually, may the Lord bless the man who helped you. And so she's really, what she's saying is, tell me more. What happened today? There's something going on here. Tell me more. So Ruth told her mother-in-law about the man in whose field she had worked. She said, the man I worked with today is named Boaz. And Naomi responds, may the Lord bless him. He is showing his kindness to us as well as to your dead husband. That man is one of our closest relatives, one of our family redeemers. What's more, then Ruth said, what's more, Boaz even told me to come back and stay with his harvesters until the entire harvest is completed. God has intervened. Naomi identifies that something incredible has happened, and she is so excited. And she says, good. Do as he said, my daughter. Stay with his young women right through the whole harvest. You might be harassed in other fields, but you will be safe with him. So Ruth worked alongside the women in Boaz's fields and gathered grain with them until the end of of the barley harvest. Then she continued working with them through the wheat harvest in early summer, and all the while she lived with her mother-in-law. Such a blessing. Unexpected, out of the blue, and Naomi is getting excited. Naomi says, we continue. This is God providing. Can you see some of the heaviness and the bitterness lifting from Naomi? That is not an angry or distraught woman now speaking. She's excited and she's saying, stay there. This is good. This is good. And so in our story, we're already seeing in the course of one day, God has started to shift what they are experiencing. And one of the key things in there is this idea of kinsman redeemer that Boaz is. Kinsman redeemer. 
The kinsman redeemer is a male relative who, according to various laws, had the privilege or responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble or danger. It was actually his duty to do that. It was a beautiful system set up where if the male, the husband had passed away, someone else would step in and redeem the woman and her family. He was designated the one who would deliver or rescue someone or redeem their property. And we read about it in Genesis 48, 16, Exodus 6, 6, and throughout Leviticus. And even in Genesis 38, 8, it talks about a man whose brother died. It was his duty then, the kinsman redeemer, to marry his brother's widowed wife. Because if a husband died, a woman would have to fight for her life. She would have to fight for her survival. And it was almost impossible for her to survive on her own. It was very dangerous. Therefore, a male relative was supposed to step in the gap. But far too often, they didn't. Far too often, they were left on their own. And here we see, not only has Boaz been sent in, but he is actually the designate redeemer for Naomi and for Ruth. It's a beautiful thing. And he's filling that role. Can you think of another example of a kinsman redeemer in Scripture? There are many. But ultimately, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. And so already in this story, you're seeing a picture of how we are all in need of a redeemer stepping into our story, shifting it dramatically, quickly, so that there is a different outcome. So there's hope, there's provision, there's security. It's a beautiful picture and foreshadowing of the Messiah that would come. And the beautiful thing in this that we're going to talk about more as we go on is that even in this, this is the lineage and line of the Messiah. And this is the story that's woven into his time. And even in a dark time when things were going so badly, if you read through Judges, it is bleak. This beautiful story is happening in the background. And that's the idea that God can work even in the midst of darkness, even when we don't know what he's doing. He is still weaving together a story in your life of redemption and hope. And so in this, I think there are a couple of things we can pull out as we come to an end of this chapter and we look to jump into chapter three where even more happens and we see the story progress and we're going to see even clearer the links with the Messiah, with Jesus' coming. But there are a couple key things when we're looking at bitterness and struggling, when we're looking at... Um, maybe battling with some thoughts, maybe if you're battling depressing thoughts, maybe if you're battling with bleakness, there's some things I think we can glean from this story. Number one, in order for her story to shift and change, Naomi had to return to her God. And her line had to change instead of blaming God for everything. Do you notice at the end of that chapter, she's now blessing and proclaiming his name in a good light. She's had to forgive him and stop blaming him. And she started to look at the good that God is doing in her life. That's the first thing we see Naomi doing. The second thing is, we can't isolate ourselves. When we're struggling, sometimes I don't want to tell people, I want to curl up and just deal with it on my own. And yet she came and she told her story to her friends and her family and the people in the village. It was a real challenge, but she was very open. And this story circulates, and because Boaz knows her struggles, it's part of the reason he shows kindness to them. So when you are struggling, we have to allow others in. We can't just isolate. We need to include and allow some people into our journey. The third thing I think we can see is that there were small steps that had to be taken. They couldn't just stay where they are. And as they took steps to the, maybe what would they would have thought was one of the nearest fields, God made huge changes. Think of in one day what shifted there as she simply took the walk to one of the nearest fields. And sometimes the greatest thing you can do when you're struggling or when you're feeling overwhelmed 
is to take some small steps and do one thing. It doesn't have to be the biggest thing. You don't have to deal with the big problem. She wasn't solving everything, but she was doing one little thing to help with her situation. And you can see everything else started from that one little step. I think the fourth thing I can see here is take help when it is offered. That can be hard. And yet in this story, Ruth and Naomi are not too proud to accept the help that their other friends and relatives want to give to them. That Boaz wants to shower them with, that he wants to help them, and they're willing to take that help. Be patient. It can take time for the process, though. This is only the beginning of it. There's more to come. And sometimes we want a solution in one day. Now we can see in one day a lot happened, but there's more to come. And God's at work to bring a much greater solution than just providing them food. I want to invite the worship team to come on up and join me. And the last thing is trust in God. Even when it seems dark, even when it seems like things aren't able to be restored, she is, they're both trusting that God is still there. Naomi is still holding on. God is still in the picture, even though she blamed him for a lot of things. She didn't doubt he was there. He was at work. And as soon as things were going well, she right away gave him the credit. Trust in God. He is the only one that can help us through. So wherever you're at today, I pray that some of these things can speak to you. We're all battling with different things. And maybe there's one of those things that's speaking to you, to, to you today that you need to, you need to do. Um, I'd like to also just do a little bit of a, a recap from something we talked about in January. We talked about the power of four, about being in God's word four times a week, the majority of the time. And about being, about how God's word transforms and changes us. And so as a part of this series, we're going to invite you into a journey this coming week where it's, an, it's a way for you to be in his word each day of this week. We are doing a devotional series through you Bible version app, and it's called um, Ruth. And it's seven days, a journey through Ruth that we're inviting everyone to join us in. Um, the version Bible app, uh, can we throw the picture up there? If you go to the version Bible app, you can get it on Google Play or App Store on the, um, from, from Apple. You can go in there and you can look up our church and join us, and then it'll be right there. It's starting today, actually, and tomorrow. You can actually join tomorrow, too, if you want. But it's a way for us to travel through the scriptures together, to read the story together, and there's an opportunity in there to comment back and forth about what's impacting you. We want to try and make ways for us to travel through God's word together. Even as we're doing sermon series, we want to make that a priority. That's been a priority for our year moving forward. And so this is just another way that you can engage you can travel through God's word as we're doing a preaching series. It's an excellent one week um, Bible devotional. And maybe this is one way that you can follow up on some of the things we've been talking about during the messages. So one of the things we want to continue to emphasize is what is God saying to you today and what are you going to do about it? What is God saying to you today? What are you going to do about it? What part of the message caught your attention? What has God been getting your attention with? And out of that, what is he calling you to do? we see that there was something that Ruth had to do. Transformation happens when we walk out what God is saying to us. And that's what we want our focus to be. So I'd encourage you to join us with that devotional. Now let's just have an opportunity to reflect, think back on maybe some of the things God's provided in your life that maybe didn't seem that significant, but it is such a key part of this story today. Is even when there's small things, they can be shifting the trajectory of your life. So as we worship together, I would encourage you to be thinking and reflecting on the goodness of God. Please stand.
mystery Faithfulness is what beside me The winter storms made way for spring And every season from way evidence of God in our lives is here. It is in your lives. It's in the lives of those around you. And so I feel like God's saying this week, maybe you need to take a day and maybe write down some of those things where God has been faithful, where God has been at work in your life and remind yourself because the evidence is here. The goodness of God is all over our lives. And sometimes we find it hard to look beyond the difficult things, the struggles and the hard things we're going through right now. But I would encourage you, Maybe that's what God's asking you to do this week. And something else that's been on my heart from this message is the beauty of what Boaz did. His own experiences out of his own struggles, out of his own story, he stepped in to help someone in a similar story. And I think God's calling us to do that for each and one and each, each other, for all those around us. When you hear someone that's struggling and you've experienced that same thing before, I think you're in a beautiful position to speak into their life and encourage them. It's such a beautiful God-given opportunity to minister to someone. So today, whatever you're going through, we want to be able to journey with you. If there's anything you need prayer for, Bill and Lois are at the back. They'd love to pray with you. Maybe you mentioned it to someone around you. 
But I just want to encourage you that the evidence of God is all over, all over our lives. May that be on your minds and your hearts as you go forward this week. Let me just say a quick prayer to bless you. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you're good. Thank you that you are working all things good for those who love you. And that even when we can't see it, we don't know what's going on, you are still there. May you encourage those today who came with heavy hearts. May you encourage those who are seeking answers to difficult problems. May your face shine upon them. May your mercy be upon them. May we go with renewed hope. In your name I pray, amen. God bless. May God bless you this week in everything you do. Have a great week. We're so glad you could join us today. And we encourage you to continue to trust God in every day and learning to trust him in everything that he says. And we'd love to connect further with you. Mm -hmm. Go to our website at lemconline.org and click connect cards so we can get in contact. You can join a small group, either a virtual one or an in-person one, where you can build friendships, pursue Jesus, and learn what it means to help others. God has a purpose for you, no matter your age or where you live. And we'd love to help you discover and live out that purpose on an LEMC team or in your own community. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're really glad that you could be here, and we look forward to connecting with you real soon.